Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word today and the opportunity again to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you for every person that's here. What an honor to be here to worship you and give you the praise that you deserve. <clears throat> now, Lord, as we look through the word of God, prepare our hearts to receive what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, watch the Santa Claus cartoon where the, the, the toys are on what they call the Misfit Island. You remember that? And so they're, they're messed up. There's something wrong with them. They don't work. And so they end up on this island. And, and actually, it's an island they named. It's called Misfit Island. And so not only are the toys there, but there are some other things there because things talk in the cartoon, right? It's not just toys. And other people that label themselves as misfits. For some reason or another, they don't feel like they fit in with the rest of the world, so they they call themselves misfits. I guess at one time or another, we've all been there. I think we've all felt that way at one time or another in our life, that, that maybe we don't fit in. You know, maybe we, we don't really belong, or, you know, maybe we, we've been embarrassed, or we just felt different than everybody else. So a circumstance in our life kind of makes us feel like a, a misfit. You know, but for some people, it's more than just the fact that you were left out and you didn't get invited to something that you wanted to go to. It's it's not that you just showed up completely dressed wrong to a certain occasion, or maybe you were the one picked last, you know, on the on the kickball field. But but for some people, it's the way life feels. You just feel like you don't belong. You you feel like a misfit, like you don't fit in, like like you don't measure up, like you don't really have anything to offer, and and you don't think much of yourself, and, and you believe other people feel the same way, that others really don't think much about you. And for a lot of you in this room today, this is a real issue. This is a real struggle. You'd be surprised at how many people that you're around on a regular basis who struggle with this. It's a big struggle. There are many reasons, though, for having a bad self-image, for having a poor picture of yourself, for feeling like, well, I don't really belong, I don't fit in, or I'm not as good as everybody else. And so some of the reasons you feel that way is, number one, is you play the comparison game. You're bad about playing the comparison game. All too often, you make the determination of your value based on comparing yourself with somebody else, comparing yourself with other people. You compare yourself how you look and how they look, or maybe how much money you have and how much money they have, or their accomplishments compared to your accomplishments. You compare yourself to what you have decided the world's definition of success is. You compare your looks to Instagram influencers who spend tons of money on makeup and professional hairstylists and spend thousands of dollars on plastic surgery. And and let's be real here, come on, they use filters and AI, come on. You aren't seeing the real person, right? Have you ever seen those pictures where they put all the stars on there without the makeup on? Uh, Don't look so good, does it? They ain't so nice as everybody thinks they are. You compare your possessions to the rich and the famous. You know, if I only had a a new car, if I only had a bigger house, or... If I only had a, a better boat, right, then I would be successful, right? And, and so you compare your bank account to people like Elon Musk, come on, right? You're never going to measure up. Or more on a practical level, you compare your accomplishments with people you graduated with in high school or college or, or, or maybe even some people in your certain neighborhood, You know, and you say things like, wow, he's the president of his company. She's the president of their company. They've made it all the way to the top, and and you're just in the middle. And so she's living in the right neighborhood, or he's living in the right neighborhood, and you're just kind of stuck where you're at. You compare your marriage and your family situation to, listen to me, what you imagine other people's are. You imagine it. I mean, 
you know, they, they married the perfect husband or the perfect wife, and they're so beautiful. They, they have perfect kids. They even have a perfect dog, right? And when you compare your tendency, listen, when you compare, when you compare your tendency is to magnify your own faults and minimize others' faults. How many of you know everyone has faults, right? I know you think you're perfect, perfect, but, you know, let's talk to their spouse, right? At the same time, you minimize your gifts and your talents and your accomplishments, and you magnify their gifts and their talents and their accomplishments. Why is this that every time we compare, we always compare up, right? We always compare up. Right? You, you compare yourself to the CEO of a company and, and, and not the guy who can't keep a job. You compare, your, you, you, you compare the, the person that seems to have the perfect life and not to the person who can't seem to get it together, right? You see, that's just human nature. But when you compare, you always lose. You always lose. There's another game many of you play that affects your self-esteem. You play the if only game, right? If only I hadn't gotten married so young. If only I'd have married somebody different. If only I'd have finished school. If only I would have taken that, that job. If only, if only, if only. We could go on forever with the with onlys, right? But listen to me, this is important. When you dwell on the unchanging past, it chips away at your self-esteem. The unchanging past. Poor self-esteem occurs when you believe what others say about you. Maybe you grew up in a home where affirmation and praise was rare. It didn't happen very often. Maybe you had a drill sergeant mom or drill sergeant dad and, and your childhood was filled with statements like why can't you do anything right I mean why do you always have to mess everything up or how come you can't be like so and so right or maybe they would just say you're worthless you'll never amount to anything you see your self-esteem is low because the most significant people in your life would criticize you often for some people, that's what they have to deal with. Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it's been a sibling. Maybe, maybe it was a, a spouse. Maybe it was a coach or a teacher. And for years, you, you, you've talked down to yourself, and you let other people talk down to you. And, and so you internalize that, and then eventually you begin to believe it. You begin to believe that's, that's who you are. And their, their commitments and, and their criticism and their comments, it becomes your self-picture of who you are. Some of you have a poor picture of yourself because you're, uh, you've suffered abuse, very sadly. Manipulative abusers rule their victims by tearing them down, right? By tearing their self-worth down. The abuser wants you to believe that you deserve it, that it's your fault. You're the reason they treat you the way you do. And, and, and then there must be something wrong with you is what you think. It's sad, but people move from abusive relationship to abusive relationship to abusive relationship. And over time, they truly come to believe, well, it must be my fault. It just must be who I am. I, I must deserve this. Finally, for some of you, you, you suffer from a poor self-worth because you've confused a healthy self-esteem with pride. Somewhere along the line, someone convinced you that feeling good about yourself is prideful. You actually have made it a spiritual value to feel worthless. And you regularly talk down to yourself. And over time, you've said it so much, you become to believe it, and you actually believe that you're not worth much. You believe your own lies. And so if you're here today or you're watching online and, and you struggle with the low self-esteem, you know it. And you desperately want to change, but just don't know how. And you're like, what do I do? How do I, how do I lift myself up? How do I lift my spirits? How do I feel better about who I am and who God made me to be? 
You see, this is very important because the way you feel about yourself affects every relationship you have. It reflects the relationships around you, right? You'll never be able to truly love others until you learn to love yourself, until you learn to love who God made you to be. And so many people struggle with relationships because they don't even love themselves. So how can they love someone else? And so this morning, I want to give you a few thoughts on changing your self-picture, the way you view yourself. Number one, spend time with lifters. Spend time with lifters. Avoid the downers. The downers, the people who tear you down with their negative criticisms, do so because of their own low self-esteem. You can count on it. People who aim to hurt you with their words are doing it because they don't feel good about themselves. Somehow they've deceived themselves into thinking, if I make you feel bad, then it makes me feel good. So they tear you down, trying to make themselves feel better. Can I tell you, just knowing that will help you understand them more, right? Avoid them. All they are doing is revealing their own self-issues. Unfortunately, you even have people like that sometimes in church. Too many churches have a tendency to overlook the behavior instead of confronting this dysfunctional attack. Don't let controlling critics, listen, don't let controlling critics cause you to view the whole church that way. Because that's not the church. And that's not the people of Jesus Christ. They need Jesus as well. Amen? Amen. Avoid the downers. Don't spend any time with them. But spend time with the lifters. Right? Spend time with those who lift you up. Lifters are people who make you feel better about yourself. They build you up with their words. They, 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 they show appreciation. They love you. They add value and encouragement to you. And they aren't manipulating. They aren't being this way just to get something from you. Amen? Spend time with lifters. A lifter is comfortable enough in themselves and in God to demonstrate the love of Jesus. Amen? Now, this doesn't mean you ignore their faults. I said lifters, not enablers, right? But a lifter can love you and make you feel important even while challenging you about your weaknesses, amen? You say, okay, Pastor John, where do I find these, these lifters at? Man, right here. Come on Wednesday nights and get to know people, right? Join a Bible study group. Try to form relationships with them. I mean, you, you, you know, you can, you can be involved in all kinds of things. Church is a great place to find lifters. Can I tell you, there's more lifters than there are downers, amen? amen. Pastor King is a lifter. Yes. Kara is a lifter. Yes. Greg is a lifter. Derek is a lifter. There are lots of lifters in our church that after spending time with them, you feel good about yourself. And if you don't know who they are, come and talk to me and I'll arrange time for you to be with them, amen? So how do you spot a lifter? How do you know somebody, that's the person you want to be around? They speak positive about others. Right. They speak positive encouragement to you, and and, and they make you feel good when you leave them. And here's a really important one. They're honest about their own weaknesses. That's why they are patient with your weaknesses. Right. They have a gentle nature. I've never met a gentle critic. When you, are, when you are done spending time with them, you feel better about yourself and your life and your future. Find those kind of people. Search them out and get them in your life. Amen? To lift your self-esteem. Number two, lift someone else up. Lift someone else up. Be a lifter. The principle is when you lift someone else, it lifts you. When you lift someone else, it lifts you. <laughs> Find, listen, it lifts you. Find a place of ministry. I mean, teach a kid's connection class so you can lift them up. Work in the nursery so you can lift people up. Join the greeter team. Visit the homebound or the nurseries. Just get somewhere where you can lift people up. When you lift up someone else, it lifts who? You, right? Now, I want to teach you how to be a lifter. And if you want to have a ton of friends 
and change your environment. This is going to change your life if you'll do this. First of all, see people through God's eyes. Now, I'll say that, but I want you to listen to me. That doesn't happen automatically. you got to try to do that. you got to focus on that. We, att- we first see people through our own lens in the way we view them. But you got to say, God, wait a minute. Help me see this person through your eyes. Let me begin to think about how valuable they are to you, how much you love them. Like, you got to work at this, but try to see them through the eyes of God. And when you see them through a heavenly Father who loves them so much that he gave his son, Jesus Christ, come on, you will begin to see them differently. Amen? But John, how, what about the people who don't do right? What about the people who are irritating? What about the people who are hard to love? We were all there at one time, right? Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still what? Christ died for us. I mean, if God could love you while you're still a sinner, then, 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 then you can see people through the eyes of God and love them in spite of their flaws. Amen? See, downers see people through a different grid. They do. What can they do for me? Right? What can you do for me? What can I get out of this relationship? What's in it for me? How can I get them to do things my way? Right? Lifters approach life completely different. I love you because God loves you. I'm going to support you in what God has called you to be. I want to be part of the plan that God has for your life. Amen? And I'm going to lift you up and encourage you. Second, choose to see the good. Everybody say choose. Choose to see the good. There is good and bad in everyone and in everything, right? Downers choose to see the bad. Lifters choose to see the what? The good. Instead of looking for what is wrong, look for what is right. Instead of focusing on the mistakes, focus on the success of others. Amen? See people and circumstances in a different way. There's always something negative to look at. we got to learn to look at the positive. Amen? Now, it doesn't take long to find faults. And sometimes you got to put a little extra work in to find the good. But can I tell you, it's worth it. Seeing the good is the first part. Now, the next part, though, is the biggest key to changing you from a downer to a lifter. Don't just see the good, but say the good. Don't just see the good, but say it. Right? If you think, uh, if you come up to, you know it's Hayden's birthday, and you're glad it's Hayden's birthday, but you don't say happy birthday to Hayden, does it make a difference? No, you got to say the good. Say happy birthday. Say something to them. Let them know that you love them. Amen? Don't just see the good. Say the good. Paul said in Colossians 4, 6, be gracious in your, what? In your speech. The goal is to bring out the best in others in a conversation. Not put them down. Not cut them out. So write a thank you note. Send an affirming email. Tell someone you love them and appreciate them. When you do, you lift them up. Amen? You are not a downer. You are a lifter. you got to put effort sometimes into being a lifter. Amen? Do it today. Encourage somebody. Turn to the person right next to you and say, boy, you look good today. Turn to the person on the other side. Man, you look great today. (laughs) Say something nice. And I want to point this out here. Paul said, be gracious in your what? What did I say that word was? Speech. You can't be gracious in your speech if you don't talk. If you just walk by people in church and you don't say anything to them, you just walk by the people at work, you just walk by the people at Walmart, you just walk by, you just walk by, walk by, walk by. You didn't do anything good. Well, I kept my mouth shut. I get it. 
And sometimes that is good. And the Bible says to be, you know, s- slow to speak and quick to listen. But can I tell you, you cannot lift people up if you don't say something. People just come to church, sit down, do their own thing. There's quiet. They, I'm going to mind my own business. I'm going to be my own person. I'm not going to get nobody's stuff. I get that that can be a negative. But you can't be a positive if you don't talk. Right? I just want, yes. Silence is not always a good thing. It is sometimes. And for some of you, we need to talk. All right? But, but listen, it's not always a good thing. you got to talk to people. Now, I want to help you. I want to coach you a little bit, though, on how to be good. How to say good things. Some of you are like, well, that should come natural. Nope. It don't. First, don't qualify your compliments. All right? Don't, listen, don't think you have to say a negative in order to make your positive better. Just say the positive. Example, hey, Pastor John, I haven't really liked all of your sermons, but boy, that was a good one today. <laughs> wow, your negative just undid your positive. You are a downer, right? Now, I've heard a lot of people say they didn't really like the way you handled that situation. But I think you did a great job. Congratulations. There was a compliment in there somewhere. Right? Wow, Scott and Rick, that music sounded great today. It's usually too loud, but it was great today. Not a compliment. Hey, honey, I sure like that dress today better than the one you had on yesterday. Not a compliment. Right? Man, son, that is a great report card. You should be able to do that every time. I expect that from now on. On no level was that a compliment. You just missed an opportunity to lift up your child. A lot of amens on that one this morning. You look great. You look awesome. How much more are you planning on losing? That's called a backhanded compliment. It doesn't encourage anyone. Don't qualify your compliments. Just say something nice. Amen? Turn to your neighbor and say something nice. Thank you. You look awesome, Derek. Appreciate you. Next, this is important, and we need to learn to do this. You need to speak over someone what you believe they can become. Man, this is so important. The best lifters do this. Uh, You know, if if you tell someone enough that they're smart enough times, they begin to believe it, and their performance goes up. If you tell someone how special they are, they begin to believe it, and their performance goes up. I've been doing this for years with adults and kids for years and years and years and over the years as I begin to just continue to encourage them I've watched them begin to do things they didn't think they could ever do I've helped tons of musicians especially kids get involved in music and they didn't think they could do it and I just kept encouraging them and telling them how good they really were and some of them are actually playing in Nashville now and they didn't think they could play in front of people the most powerful words you can say to someone is I believe in you come on I believe in your potential. I believe in how God is going to use you. I believe that you can make a difference. I believe in you. Amen. That's another thing. Don't say I believe in you with a qualifier. Just I believe in you. I believe in you, so make sure you don't do this or that. No. We have such a tendency to want to correct. And sometimes if we would just be positive, let Jesus do the correcting. Amen. Instead of speaking what someone is, speak what they can be. There are a multitude of examples of this in the Bible. When they called David, oh, he's just a little shepherd boy. He can't be nothing. Nope, God saw him as a king and a mighty warrior. Come on, right? I mean, Gideon. Gideon said, I'm the least of the least. I'm a nobody. And Jesus, or the angel, calls him a mighty man of valor. Was Gideon a mighty man of valor when he called him a mighty man of valor? No, but
but he became a mighty man of valor, right? Mary Magdalene, she was, she was a nobody in that society, and God used her in a magnificent way. All of them didn't think they were much until God began to speak positive into their life. Let me tell you, you change people's lives when you speak positive about them, amen? Let them hear words of faith and belief coming from your mouth. There's enough people talk, speaking the negative. Let's start speaking the positive, amen? Speak what you believe they can be in Jesus Christ. Listen, saying the good means even more at the right time. So you got to think about this, at the right time. How do you determine the right time? What's the right time to say an encouraging word? When you know someone is tired, all right? When you know someone is getting criticized, when they have done something, when, they, when they've done something that didn't go so well, right? Or when they've done something that went great, or when you see how hard they're working, or when you notice something nobody else notices. These are all great times. And imagine this, you can know when to encourage somebody when the Holy Spirit leads you. <laughs> wow. Right? The Holy Spirit can lead you to do that. When you sense the direction of the Holy Spirit, listen to that. Lift them up. Amen? To be a lifter, dare to express love. I know we don't want to do that in our day and age, but, but hug them. Send them a note. Tell them, I love you. People need to hear those words. Say, I love you. You matter. I thank God for you. See, we're hesitant to express love for people because we feel like if they know what we feel about them, how much we love them, that makes us vulnerable, and then they can hurt us. And so we don't want to be vulnerable. Can I tell you, dare to love anyway, amen? What would a church be like if everyone in the church was a lifter? If we come in the church... Instead of talking about the Razorbacks, the football, or weather, or our work, but we come in here with the purpose of lifting each other up, yeah. nobody would ever miss church. Because you're like, I feel absolutely horrible. i got to get to church so somebody can lift me up today. Come on. Amen. Right? Amen. we got to lift each other up. Instead of saying, well, I'm going to come to church and sit in the chair and just kind of wait until, you know, see what the pastor has to say today. No, I'm going there to be a lifter today. Yeah. I'm going to lift somebody up. When we would do that, it would transform our community. I love this passage found in 1 Peter chapter 3 in the message version. It says, be agreeable, be sympathetic, be loving, be compassionate, be humble. That goes for all of you. No exceptions, no retaliation, no sharp tongue or sarcasm. Instead, bless, bless Bless, excuse me, instead, bless. That's your job, to bless. You'll be a blessing and also get blessed. Amen? That's awesome. Our job is to bless each other. Amen? Our job is to lift each other up. And then when we do that, God blesses us. Amen. So be a lifter. Next, number three, replace wrong thinking with the truth of God's word. This is so important, guys. You, you have to replace the wrong thinking if you want to have a good self-esteem with the truth of God's word. How many of you believe God's word is true? You got to believe what God's word says about you then. Not what circumstances, not what your emotions tell you. What does God's word say? Wrong thought. I'm just a mistake. I'm a big mistake. I can't do anything. Everything I do is a mistake. I'm a miserable failure. You know, that's wrong thinking. Replace it with the Word of God. What's the Word of God say? Truth. God designed you. Amen? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Who did that? God. Come on. Ephesians 2.10. For you are God's workmanship. God's workmanship. Right? Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. <clears throat> Look at me. God designed you. God designed you. And God has a plan for your life. You are the workmanship of his creation. 
He sees you as you see your kids. You see your kids as valuable. You love them. You care about them. That's the way God sees you, and that's who you are. Amen? Wrong thought. I'm worthless. I'm not good enough for anything. Replace that thought with the truth of God's Word. Amen? Listen, the value of something is determined by what somebody's willing to pay for it. So if you take a, a baseball card and and for most of us, it's just a piece of plastic or a piece of cardboard. And, but if you take it to a certain place and somebody gives a million dollars for that card, how much is that card worth? A million dollars. Now, you may think your house is worth a million dollars. But somebody only wants to give you 500000 Nobody will pay more than 500000 How much is your house worth? 500000 Right? Listen, your worth is determined by what God was willing to pay for you. You hear that? The truth, God paid a high price for you. You are not your own. You are bought at a price, right? What was that price? For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefather but the precious blood of Christ a lamb without blemish and defect amen you are worth the blood of Jesus God loves you so much that he sent his son and Jesus gave his life for you how valuable are you Amen. Your worth, listen to me, your worth is not determined by your current circumstance. How many of circumstances change all the time? But God's love never changes. Your value never changes, amen? But John, you don't know what I've done. You don't know how many times I've messed up. You don't know how much I've failed. God does. God does, and God said in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. You're valuable. You matter. You are somebody. And your circumstances do not take that value away from you. Even your mistakes and value, failures doesn't, doesn't negate your value. You're still important to Jesus. So if you struggle with self-esteem or you have a low self-image, this message is probably kind of tough. It's kind of hard for you to hear. But you need to understand, this message wasn't to point out that you have a low self-esteem. It was to point out that you are valuable in Jesus. That God loves you and God has a plan for you today. Today's message is that God loves you, God values you, you're important to God, God wants to help you. He wants to heal your emotions, He wants to heal your mind, He wants to heal your spirit. God wants you to be full of joy, amen, the joy of the Lord that can be your strength. He wants to lift you up today. So here's what I want you to do, I want you to stand to your feet. We're going to end the service a little different today. Instead of me praying for you or us praying for each other, I want you to spend some time alone with God. And I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. We're going to take communion today. And why, why are we doing that? Because when you take communion, you're remembering what Jesus did for you. You're remembering his body. Now think about this. Jesus, nobody took his life. The stripes flesh being tore, crown of thorns on his head, the plucking of the beard, the hitting in the face, the nailing to the cross, the spear in the side. You hear this all the time, but that was for you. That was for you. I'll never forget when I was just a little boy, I heard a preacher say one time, if you were the only one who would have accepted Jesus, he still would have died on how valuable you are the, the world has a way of beating us down the world has a way of making us think that we're less than 
Well, listen, no matter what you've done doesn't change the fact that Jesus still died on the cross for you. And actually, that's the reason he died on the cross for you. So that we can be forgiven and we can live a life of value. In Luke chapter 22, verse 19, it says, And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He's saying, when you take that bread, you remember what I did for you. And you remember how much I love you. He goes on saying, likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup is poured out for you. The cup represents the blood of Jesus. This blood is poured out for you. It is the new covenant in my blood. It was the blood of Jesus. And so what I want us to do is I want us to find a place. We've got four different corners. Get you some bread, get you some juice, and I want you to sit down, and I want you to spend time with God right now. And I want you to remember what God did for you. And when you're ready, you take the bread, and when you're ready, you drink the juice. This is between you and God, so you can take a moment and remember just how valuable you are to God. Think about what He does. Amen? Let's take our communion. Lord, your word says that you were wounded for our transgressions, our sins, our failures. You were bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was placed upon you. And Lord, by your stripes, we're healed. Today, God, we thank you that you paid such a high price for us. So don't let the devil. Don't let the devil in our flesh rob us of who we are in Christ. That we are valuable. We cannot let our circumstances, God, tear us down. So God, I pray you would just make it real today. In everybody's heart that is here today, make it real that how much you really love us. How really of an important person we are. And to embrace who you've made us and to take our experiences in life and learn from them and grow and to share the love of Jesus with others. Lord, help us to get rid of the if only game and the comparison game. Lord, there's people that I can reach that nobody else can reach. There are people that other people can reach that I will never reach. And so, God, we just need to be who you called us to be and walk in your love and walk in your favor, and walk in your purpose for our life. Help us to walk out of this place knowing that we are valuable, that we are actually somebody, because we are a child of God. And we give you praise and glory and honor for that in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, Forever free tomorrow night. I want to encourage everyone to come out. If you haven't been a part of that yet, you need to come and see what it's all about. And don't forget Wednesday night, we won't be having service. But God bless and have a wonderful day.